Good morning. Um, you, this is a bit of an unusual situation for me. I'm uh, normally outside uh, doing videos, but um, given the weather in Southern California, it's I'm holed up in a hotel room down down near the southern border. Uh, I'm going to be sort of trail angeling and doing some uh, um, early support work before I actually start hiking myself. Um, everyone's concerned about snow, snow and ice. Um, it's the worst I've seen in quite a while, um, and I'm hearing it's record breaking. Now, what you're going to do at the start of the trail is you're probably going to be wondering, do I bring snow gear? So you can bring things like, I'm pulling up all my snow gear here. Um, right, ice axes, do you need them from the start? No, you probably want to send that to Paradise Valley Cafe at mile 151.8 based on the snow reports from San Jack John, which is the San Jacinto Trail report. I, I think it's pretty advisable to um, send your ice axe there. Um, I think a lot of people are saying now, maybe take your spikes from Campo because there's gonna be lots of patches where just, you're not gonna go, to, you're not gonna slide down a chute or anything, but you're just staying on your feet. This, this is the train is relatively, sta relatively stable, um, um, but having spikes early in the morning it certainly means you're not gonna be slipping and sliding and jarring your knees or ankles early in the morning. So I'm probably gonna be using spikes um, from the start. Uh, and picking up my ice axe at Paradise Valley Cafe. Um, the other thing I'm th considering at Paradise Valley Cafe is also sending my full set of Cthulhu crampons. Um, again, I'm gonna be watching the snow report, the, the San Jacinto Trail report, um, and taking their advice. Definitely gonna need, <laughs> I'm pretty certain I'm gonna need an ice axe, and I'm, I'm fully expecting that we're gonna need crampons as well, um, certainly in the high areas, uh, depending on your confidence level. If you've not done huge amounts of snow and ice work, then there's lots of diverts to down to idle wild, so you don't actually have to go through the dangerous bits if, based on the reports, it's looking very sketchy. Um, there are other makes of uh, 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 spikes. I've, I've used a set of snow lines and Cthulhu's last year and the year before, just to try them. Both seem to work fine. They give you good traction in snow and ice, but the crampons are for where you, we think the, the snow and ice is going to be, um, yeah, quite, quite uh, six, uh, thick in terms of not, not just going into the snow, but also being able to get traction on solid ice that's probably compacted underneath. Um, uh, I'm also a fan of the Whippet, which is the trekking pole from Black Diamond, which has an ice axe head on the top. Um, for this particular section, for the early sections, um, again, I'm probably gonna use the ice axe, full ice axe for San Jacinto, and I'm probably expecting, again, based on the, the reports, um, it's gonna be a full ice axe um, for the um, Sierra. I, wherever it's wherever it's some sort of reasonable, medium snow, I would use the Whippet. Um, but no, it's looking quite excessive this year. So yeah, I'm, I'm switching, I'm gonna probably switch to a full ice axe. And the other thing I would say about ice axes is I personally, you're gonna read a manual and people say, oh, you measure it from your ankle. I tend to go slightly longer um, on my ice axe because I tend to, have it in my hand long periods so i don't want to be constantly stooping all the time if it's too short so you obviously you don't want to go too long but you don't want to go super short because too short is what the short ones are really for when you're going up a very steep terrain and you're constantly lifting your arm up to basically belay yourself as you as you ascend um so yeah follow the advice of the of the um the retailers go into a store if you can and buy one try it and see how it feels in your hand uh, and explain you're going to be trekking um, and, and discuss whether or not you need a, you know, a short ice axe or can you would a slightly longer one be beneficial if you're going to be trekking for long periods in in between um, uh, the snowshoots that you may have to cross okay um, uh, I'm going to do this video in stages so this this uh, the, the the other thing I'm going to suggest today is talk about today is um, water water issues now again with the weather normally we're the desert we're wondering you know where we're going to get the water i don't think we're going to have that problem certainly not for march anyway um so uh obviously you're going to have a filter so the most common filter is uh, one of these it's a soy squeeze based on hollow fiber there's another um technology same sorry, same technology using cation b3 this is a one liter bottle uh, I personally prefer this one because it's faster, but this one lasts longer because you can back flush it. Uh, so this is probably the most popular. Be careful with these. You need that washer there. That washer there is one which, which you seal onto your smart water bottle. So what I would advise is, um, and it's something that pops off when you're hiking. Uh, sorry, when you're constantly changing the bottle, um, uh, the filter off the, off the top of the bottle. So if you, uh, if you can, um, stop on off uh, um, Home Depot and just get 
uh, a set of hose washers. So these are just go Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, and this, this set of washers, there's about 10 of them there. Um, cost me, I think, about $2, I think. <laughs> so, uh, and that those brown ones will replace this. So I always carry a spare. I don't carry all these, but I carry, do carry a spare. If you do find you've lost it, probably go into one of the stores like Two Foot Adventures at Julian. They hit, I don't know if he helped me out one time and I needed one. He normally has some in the drawer. Um, and if, if any retailer charges you for that, then shame, shame on yeah, shame on them. It's, but they, they won't. Uh, Two Foot were very nice. They, they just gave me some spare kits out of their drawers that they, you know, that, that they knew hikers needed. And most of the good stores would give you things like this for free. So be wary of people who charge you for everything. Um, right, that's water filters. The other thing I do carry also is a tab of, uh, these are chlorine dioxide tablets, simply because if my filter breaks um, on trail, I've got that, those those uh, abilities to um, basically decontaminate my water. At least I can tell I can get to another hiker to borrow their filter or off trail. Now, with these water filters, you have to be careful in cold weather because if you get water in there overnight and it freezes, that expands, cracks the fibers and your filters then useless. So in this cold weather, um, certainly in early March and probably going into April as well, make sure you put your filter in a Ziploc bag and stuff it down the bottom of your uh, sleeping bag or quilt religiously because you do not want to lose your filter. It's annoying to try and get another one of these on trail. Um, the other thing I would say is um, if anyone has bought one of these recently um, and maybe used it on a practice hike, be, be aware that they can dry out such that um, what happened last year uh, and in previous years, uh, some people have arrived on trail, tried to filter water um, and they couldn't get water, any water through. And all that happened was the fibers had dried out um, and they just need a little bit of um, basically back flushing using the syringe back flush with some warm water and just gradually increase the pressure through the back through the filter and it just reopens the fibers uh, and then you get the filter back to normal uh, but people were throwing the filter away thinking they'd actually you know the filter had, had, had been compromised and all it just needed, needed was just need to be moistening up the fibers um, and reopened it so yeah check your filter the day, maybe the day before at Cleef or in your hotel room just to check uh, it's flowing well or you know get the syringe or if you if you find it, it's not flowing well get to Cleef and I'm sure someone will have have a syringe there um, at the equestrian center um, just near the south terminus so they can you can just borrow the syringe um, the manufacturers say you could use vinegar to um, uh, basically back flush and clean it out um, I think if, you, if you're going to the point where you need vinegar which is acetic acid to, to basically to uh, dissolve any um, calcium carbonate deposits things like that then you probably use the filter quite a lot if you're going to, if you're going to the point of needing vinegar I'd probably say just get another filter, but it's normally warm water. And we rescued more than 30 of these last year at Lake Morena, where people just, just fall in foul of the fact they hadn't realized the filter had tried out. Um, okay, so that's filters. I will stop, pause there, and move on to the next section. Okay, this one is on just uh, general hiking preparation. I'm sure we've all gone on shakedown hikes. I'm sure we've all got a few uh, blisters. I hope you have, um, because you just want to harden your feet a little bit before you get on trail. Um, so you know where the hot spots are. So if you, as soon as you get a hot spot, try and treat it early. And also, um, you've been hiking, maybe get some chafing with some with your gear, sweating a little bit. Um, that's good to know because one of the common things that drags hikers down very early on is the combination of lots of little things coming together that are you know, problems or issues that just weigh them down. It's it, so try and, and the big ones are the physical ones. So f try and avoid getting new blisters by getting some before trail. Harden your feet up so your skin's rock hard. You will get some small hot more hot spots because you're on trail longer, but at least you know what to expect. And you're you're not going to arrive in uh, say Lake Moreno or Mount Laguna with feet shredded for the first time because then you you need a good few days for them to recover. Same thing with chafing. Um, if it, c it can get really bad when, it get, when the desert does actually warm up and get hot, um, and you can actually get red, raw, red raw between your thighs or, or in certain places where, um, again, it's avoidable if you c if you know in advance where the, where your susceptibilities are. Certainly with the gear you're using, if you've got shorts, try them out. Uh, if you've got a liner in particular, I found on one pair of shorts, I actually had to cut the liner out uh, on the training hike to realize to stop the chafing. So definitely a big issue to deal with um, and, and before the trail if you can. Also, um, with footwear, um, I use Ultras, but there's lots of other brands out there. You've got to find the shoes that work for you. It's something that uh, I focused on in a video last year around uh, orthotics. Check if you need them. The reason being is because it's, I, for the first 30 or 40 years of my of my hiking uh, experiences, I never needed orthotics, but I never nearly, really went on a super extended trip. 
And what happens is it's after, th after three or four weeks of continuously on, on you know, pounding, um, if you have any problems with your, um, your, your gait, if you like, you could potentially might need orthotics. Now, I found that out uh, early on uh, while I was doing training for the PCT. If you've got niggling knee problems before you start, then that, you know, do a quick check on that. That could be an indication. So when you're through training, you've got some injuries. That could be an indication you might need to orthotics or at least getting checked out because you don't want to be in a situation where you have an injury and you're constantly pounding your, your, your injury on trail and trying to manage it at the same time because it's very unlikely you're going to last 2,650 miles. Try and get it uh, dealt with earlier. And I post a video on, on orthotics and the experiences I went through during my training. So if you've got time, still got a bit more time before you start trail, might be worth exploring if you've, if you've got some niggling knee problems and you can relate to some of the experiences I had in that I expressed in that video. So I uh, hope that's useful to you. Um, actually, well, sticking with footwear, um, uh, suit shoes, um, I uh, used a darn tough socks. Um, the, I had three pairs and I rotated them. But um, Darn Tough has, is a, probably the most common brand, but uh, it also has this um, uh, guarantee that uh, it will replace socks that are badly damaged, if you have sold, ho holes worn in, and it says that the stores will honour them. So up the trail, when you try and take those socks into stores, um, I've never had one um, uh, offer to replace socks, except the outfitters in Etna, which is, thank you Etna, they were brilliant. They had a full stock of spare socks on, you know, old, um, I think it was last year's stock, that were signed to be replacements for darn tough um, failures on trail. They were the only store that uh, ever offered that that uh, exchange process, even though the guarantee says they should. And I do. I know some retailers who say, "Oh, you know, we'll honour the honour the um, darn tough agreement of replacement uh, damaged socks um, if you've bought them from us." Which is, yeah, that's a great guarantee. Really useless to be honest, because you're going to be a thousand miles up the trail before you need to replace them. So why not? You might as well just send them back to to darn toughs. That's not. That's not a retailer helping or understanding hikers. Um, but anyway, that's uh, my moan. Um, uh, other things about footwear um, and so sort of calf wear, if you like, is that when you're hiking, you if you suffer from sit suffer from shin splints, I do get that. I get the onset of shin splints if I do road walks. If I'm pounding hard, so I use things like these compression socks. Now, this is one particular brand. I've used lots of other brands, but they're just basically calf compression sleeve so don't get hung up on this particular brand um, and it just means it gets gets compression around um, your shins such that when you're hiking it reduces the um, the onset of shin splints so uh, uh, and I as soon as I come off uh, the roads and things and, and the the pain's gone away I, I had so I had those uh, on standby if I knew the sections where I was potentially going to be doing a road walk um, so I'm just looking at my list down. We've we've talked about making your uh, hiking shakedown hikes, which I'm sure you've done. Um, you're probably putting stuff in your backpack now and weighing it, going, "Oh my God, it's heavy." Um, base weight. Don't get too hung up on it. If you're somewhere between 16 and 20, maybe 22 with some camera gear or something as a starting weight. You should you should go as low as possible, as low as you reasonably realistically can. But I think there's two factors here. One, you've got to go through a learning process yourself. You're, you're going to shave it down as much as you can before you start. Then once you go on trail, you're going to discover things that you really, really need. And Lake Morena Hiker Box and Mount Laguna Hiker Box are really interesting because you do see what people are willing to drop. And it's normally luxuries that you... you they just needed to convince themselves they don't really, really need it. And um, that, that happens a lot. And I, I went through that same process myself. So you, you can... Um, uh, you can pack your bag, but then realize I don't really need that. So don't get too hung up on base weight. Yeah, if you're 16 to 20 um, at the start, you will bring that down. Um, backpack, um, you'll see people doing, uh, again, ultra light, uber light, so 30, 40 liter packs. I, can, I do a 55 to 60 pack, which I can cinch down. I just happen to use the Z-Packs are cool, but there's lots of other brands out there like Hyperlite and, um, um, uh, I will post a few more <laughs> um, that uh, do the same thing. Uh, be aware of the fact that if you go too small uh, on a backpack, you are then working towards the weight limits of that backpack. Now, normally that wouldn't be an issue, but if you're going through the Sierra and you're loading it with a bear can and extra food and you're pushing the backpack way over its uh, weight limit, then don't be surprised if straps break. And I saw hikers with broken straps in the Sierra, which is possibly the worst place for it to happen. And they were shoulder straps. And dare I say it, they were all hyperlites because the hyperlite stitching here is one of their weak points but if you buy a pack that sufficiently has a weight a weight tolerance then they're fine but i think um 
uh, if you go too tight on the, the limits, you risk the stitching of your, your basic shoulder straps of your backpack coming away. And hyperlights on, sadly, I saw that a lot. Um, uh, so uh, be aware of that. Uh, when they say weight limit, they probably mean it. Um, right, other things. Uh, you've obviously done um, all the uh, body conditioning and you are reasonably fit. If you, I hope you should be able to hike at least five to, at least 10 uh, to 12 from the outset and turn it on. Uh, ideally, uh, that means you at least you've, you've gone through the process of carrying your backpack, you've seen where all the wear points are. If you're starting off at five miles, and certainly in the conditions at the moment, then it's gonna take you, what, three or four days to get to Lake Morena. I'm, then I'd probably say, um, if you haven't started yet, go and do a bit more training. Try and get at least, up to, you can do 10 or 12 um, from the outset. I would, that's, that would be my advice. Because then you're on a good, reasonable, steady starting pace, 10 or 12, just, just and then build it up. Um, if you're one of these people who are reasonably fit already and could do Lake Marin in 20 uh, miles in the first day, I do that regularly, again, but I'm hike fit. Um, not for everybody, but yeah, a lot of people do. But it also means that when you get to Lake Marin, what you'll find is if you are, you'll be exhausted, uh, you will find you may not be super hungry. You need to actually go to the Lake Marin <laughs> malt shop and actually have a, you know, force yourself to eat. You may not feel hungry on the first day. It's a strange situation. You think you'd be starving. But you, you actually just feel tired and exhausted. You just want to go to sleep. You still need to eat and pack those calories on, um, and also make sure you rehydrate. Um, again, uh, take um, when you arrive at Cleef, uh, take advice from the local people, uh, from the shuttle people, and the people at Cleef who will advise you on the water sources on the first section and certainly through March. There shouldn't be too much of a problem, uh, given the amount of water that's flowing at the moment um, and the amount of snow there. But uh, yeah, it can change very quickly in the desert. So when you get to um, Campo at the start, um, get their advice on what the current status of the water sources are. So don't look online, just get the latest and relevant um, updates. Uh, when you start off, get into the habit of a day-to-day -day routine of checking the weather, checking the dates, checking where you're planning to be. The reason being is um, you can get caught out by the weather, so you may find that uh, um, you know, if, if you find out there's a storm coming and all the hotel rooms are booked up, you don't want to be the last person to find that out because all the bookings have, <laughs> will be have gone. Um, you also want to watch, avoid booking on weekends for hotels if you're staying over there or hostels because guess what, they fill up, they've got day hikers, you're going to have day hikers as well and they're going to be more expensive over the weekends. And also, um, when you're staying in these places, or trying to book these places, sorry, be aware certainly of, of holidays and national holidays and weekends because you will lose track of the days of the week as you're hiking along. You will just lose it. Um, so I've, um, I did see a hiker or met a hiker who had really made fallen foul of this because they'd sent something to a post office. The post office didn't open on a Saturday morning and it was a national holiday on the Monday. So they had to wait till Tuesday to pick up the box. You know, that's the worst case scenario. So you definitely want to be in a situation where you're one, checking the weather, so you know you're, in good, you're, you're not going to be hammered by rain for three days in a row. Um, you know when to get off trail comfortably, you know when to pick up your boxes, um, and you know what the day of the week is, um, so you don't screw up uh, not only your arrivals in towns, um, and you're, you're not trying to do something, or you know do something really critical on a national holiday. Um, and it can happen, certainly from, uh, from a foreign perspective, you're just not aware of the dates. Um, right, I will pause there and um, move on to the next one. Okay, um, some of the other final decisions you're probably going through are your navigation tools and electronics. So let's go through some of that. Uh, the most common tool is the Guttux Far Out app, which um, I can't show you because it's on my phone, which is I'm recording this video <laughs> on my phone. Great app um, because it has updates on uh, all the different milestones uh, or waypoints that hikers say, oh, the water's flowing, or yeah, this this ho this retail is brilliant or bad, um, uh, or this restaurant is great, um, give them an extra tip or something. That's that's why people regularly recommend Far Out. There are Far Out as the app to, to go f uh, select for through hiking. There are it was all trails as Gaia, but they don't have the same buy-in from all the hikers. Um, so go with your favorite, but I personally like Far Out. Um, it also has um, the facility to download what are called offline maps. So you can get a map of not only the trail where it is, but also you can get topographical overlays which show the contours around you. Um, so they are good for um, if you like map reading um, and being able to see where you are in the surrounding terrain. Now, when it comes to um, map 
mapping, uh, should you carry paper maps? Now, the general advice you'll hear from everybody, um, certainly from Mountain Rescue and from uh, Forest Rangers, is you should carry paper maps. Now, the problem is the resolution of um, the available maps are, shall we say, disappointing. I used to do orienteering competitions quite seriously. Um, and you do need a certain level of um, features on the map that you can then relate to something visible in front of you in the train. Now, if you're in poor weather, reduced cloud, then you need a reasonable resolution map. Now, the maps that are available currently for the PCT are these things. These are the PCT maps, um, Pacific Coast Rail. They are 1 to 75,000, whereas they have a, a 1 to 63,000 booklet for the Sierra. That for me is way too pulled out. It's they're great overview maps. They're great to be able to say, oh look, I can I can I can do a big resupply there, and you can see the surrounding terrain. Mind you, you can do that with fire as well. But it's a paper version that allows you to um, basically have situational situational awareness. But for navigation in poor conditions, I'm sorry, these aren't good enough. I don't think these are particularly good. I, I would only in, I would, they're, they're very expensive as well. I am sorry to, that they rep these replace what we call half mile maps. Now these were maps that were I think one to forty thousand, which were about on the, the the limit really in terms of reasonable resolution and um, uh, sort of features that you could relate to, and you could get them for free online. Uh, and download them literally and print them out as batches in sections, which was great. Um, now they've been withdrawn, or at least um, uh, they, they are still available online in certain places, uh, but people keep copies of, of the old versions. Now the maps themselves haven't largely changed, but the, maybe the data around them have, like the updates on the milestones and things. Um, and I like those maps, but to have them replaced by these, uh, I don't know which agencies decided on these, I'm sorry, PCTA and National Geographic, these aren't good for navigation in poor weather. They're not. They're, they're, the resolution's too poor. Um, these are the kind of ones you want. They're one to 42,000 maybe, and there's one to 31,000. But in fairness, you can't have, you know, if you needed a pile of these to cover the whole of the PCT, you probably need a pile about that thick. So I do accept that these are the probably the most available, useful available at the moment, but they're not fit for purpose, certainly for navigation in poor conditions because they're so zoomed out on the resolution. One to 75,000, come on, you can't navigate with that. Not in poor weather anyway. Um, but yeah, you make your choice. Uh, I, uh, my choice was to use the Guttux Far Out app and also uh, I have an InReach and Explorer Plus, which is a full screen GPS with separate downloaded maps. So it's um, basically it's a, um, an iPhone, with a GPS system and a mapping system and a handheld GPS in reach system with a mapping system and a communication system separate. They're two separate electronic devices. So I've got to be pretty unlucky to lose both and they're both waterproof. Um, uh, so I, I personally have got away from not carrying paper maps, but if I do print out some of the half mile maps, because I've got my I've got the old files, um, certainly through some of the sections, of, uh, just because I like to practice orienteering. Um, and for orienteering, um, do you really, really, really need a compass? Um, you, again, it's a trial. You probably don't really need a compass unless you're really into this sort of thing. So I used to use, well, this is the standard one. This is a silver compass, oh, sorry, Sunto compass. This is a competition uh, orienteering thumb compass. So you might use that. Um, this is uh, one of the basic sighting compasses with a nice little mirror. So you can have lots of toys. Um, and this is a, my favorite sort of sighting compass. We can basically sight, literally sight down there and read the bearing. Um, I love these kind of things, but I never used these on the PCT. I just didn't need them. Um, what I do carry, is I said, I carry the Fire Out app and I carry with maps and I carry the InReach full screen with maps separate. Um, but I also carry, I do carry a small button compass such that if I do get really screwed up, I can at least orientate myself uh, very quickly. Um, I also carry a uh, whistle. This is another form of communication that's very important, certainly for um, if you're just off trail, if you slipped off somewhere and you cut, you're out of sight and you need to get someone's attention, first uh, uh, element of communication. And the other thing I do carry, and I've always carried this, um, is a, sh it's actually a shaving mirror. I use it as a shaving mirror, but it is actually a signaling mirror. It is a, um, an emergency signaling mirror. It weighs next to nothing. And I, my primary use is to keep my, my, my shaving <laughs> in, in good, sort of good nick. And it's a reasonably good mirror. 
but it doubles as a signaling mirror. And if you want to get the attention of a helicopter, and um, I did do some tests of these many years ago in the French Alps um, as a basic part of an exercise. Uh, and again, they are very, very good. They do work. You know, obviously you need sunny conditions, but if you, if you are trying to get someone's attention, these work. But um, anyway, these, are, these things are strapped to my, my um, top right hand um, strap of my backpack. So it's closest to me. So all those imme immediate things are right next to me. And my in reach is here. Um, so I've got that as well if I need the SOS. Um, and I've got my phone uh, in my in my um, bum bag, what you call it, what you call it, family pack. Um, so anyway, uh, the other things I carry in terms of electronics um, is I uh, carry a, uh, I have a head torch that's rechargeable, a night core. I have uh, anchor headphones. These are Bluetooth headphones. I like the fact that these are able to be easily recharged. They last actually a very good, very good battery. They last the whole day for me on the podcast listening. Um, I, I could have one ear. I love the over ear aspect of these because um, if I don't have that, uh, po pods just fall out at some point. Uh, this this takes a lot of tugging to pull out. I can also um, drape that over my ear so I have the other ear listening out for rattlesnakes or little, you know, other hikers talking to me. Um, and then I, can, I might switch them the other day. Uh, but the Bluetooth and you know if I, if I need to pull them out, I just drop them and they're around my neck. So. Uh, Love these these kind of headphones. Uh, I also carry um, uh, I, t I carry uh, my iPhone. I carry uh, a couple of battery packs. I I, I normally have a ten thousand milliamp hour um, night core. I do have another ten thousand uh, anchor. This is my old one. This is obviously lighter, and they do roughly work about the same ten thousand milliamp hour. Um, I do have another five thousand, which I might carry through the Sierra if I'm uh, uh, worried about. Um, you know, maybe not um, running out of power through the Sierra. Uh, but the other thing I've sort of uh, finalised uh, recently um, is my recharging. So um, you're always sort of thinking, oh, you know, what 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 plugs should we use? What sockets should we use? Now, um, should we you know use one of these big new ones, these gallium nitride ones? Now, what you need to do is look up online for your specific devices the maximum charging rate. So for my iPhone, it's 18 watts. That means that if I want to charge my phone at the fastest possible rate, then I probably want a charging plug that has at least a 20 watt charging rate. So that will charge my phone at the maximum speed with the cable that came with the phone. Um, I have a lots of um, uh, issues around how I charge my fast charge my battery pack. Now, I, this has a certain charging rate. I can't remember what it is. I think it's 15 watts or 18 watts. Again, I want to make sure that my total charging capacity of my plug can deal with these devices. Um, so I actually have a 32 watt. I haven't got it handy here, but it's basically a 32 watt plug like this. That uh, two sockets that allows me to charge my phone and pretty much maximise my charging of my um, uh, battery pack at the same time in Intel. The other thing I do carry is. Um, this one, now you might think, well, I'm carrying this one as well. Well, this is very light. It's also two socket and it's low power ones. Now these are useful for charging uh, headphones and um, head torches, you know, if you want to charge them up. And it's also a spare if for some reason you drop your other pug. But it just means I can, in a, in a certain situation, I can I can charge up my phone and battery pack and I can charge my, my uh, other stuff. And again, if I lose one of these, I've at least got something at backup. But what's interesting, is that the new devices, these ones here, these Anchor Gallium Nitro ones, this is a 65 watt charging, multi-socket, you think on paper, this is brilliant, this would do everything. The downside is, this is heavier than these two together by a, by a notable difference, because it's high power, uh, high wattage technology, Gallium Nitro, brilliant on paper, but it is actually quite heavy. Um, so I actually leave this at home which is, I thought this would be my big solution. It's not. And I go with the two plugs um, with the wattages matched to, or at least exceeding the devices I want to charge. So um, make sure you've got the charging rate. Then you don't have to sit in, when you arrive in town, you're not sitting there for two hours. Sorry, you're sitting there for two hours rather than 10 hours trying to charge a battery pack. Uh, a, a, you may find that if, you, if I try to charge my battery pack on one of these, it will take forever. Whereas on my normal, on my uh, fast charging one, um, it would be two hours, well, an hour and a half. Um, depending on if it's really uh, low down. Also make sure that the cable, you have to be careful with some of these new cables, that the cables also support the charging rate. And the only way you're gonna know is get the cables from the original um, package when you bought the phone or the, or the battery pack 
and just test them before you actually hit the trail. You may find that you know, a cable's, oh, why is it taking so long? It could just be that a cable's not spec as high as it should be. Um, I haven't had that problem personally, but I have heard of people who have said that if they've got um, certainly high wattage devices, that it, they do have to make sure that the cable is, is correct. So, uh, right, I'll stop there and move on to the next section. Okay, tents. Um, I have a duplex. Um, I also have an altiplex. I um, favour them. I've used them quite extensively and I would certainly strongly recommend Z-Packs as a tent supplier. They are expensive though, so they're not for everybody. Um, now, you do know how to put your tent up. Please tell me you know how to put your tent up because uh, if you don't, first storm you have, and given the conditions we have at the moment, certainly in March, um, you if you don't get it pitched taut and correct um you're going to get a flooded tent um and all your gear will be you know wiped out in terms of just you have to dry everything out and if it's cold and wet for the next few days it's almost impossible to dry it unless you go to a hotel or something so try and make sure you know how to put your tent up and get it taut don't buy these silly little pegs that you know little shepherd crook ones that are super lightweight but you stick them in the ground with a bit of rain they're just going to come out get something like groundhogs or mini i use mini groundhogs from msr um you can again you i use four or six of them depending on uh, what tent i use uh but they are worth the investment don't don't skimp on silly little pegs that are just next to useless um the other thing about knowing about putting a tent up is if you've got a single wall tent like a duplex you um you know how to manage condensation or at least you know you're, you've experienced it to the point where you know how to manage it and the way to do it is to slightly open the doors so you get a draft certainly with a duplex condensation is going to happen to you at some point on a single wall tent you know get, just get over it you just have to manage it now uh you may have to um uh, mop out you know the, you know, walk, you know have, a, have a towel or something or a t-shirt or something or a, a base layer that you can just use to to wipe the tent first thing in the morning so you don't want to pack it wet um, because that then wets everything down wets the floor as well um but yeah condensation is a reality and uh i was always able to manage it to the point where yeah, I only had a few occasions, but really bad, um, and that was really in the Sierra on a very cold night. So I literally had ice on the inside of my tent because it was so cold. Um, but yeah, get used to that. Um, protect your tent from the base. I use a Tyvek sheet, which is simply just to stop the abrasions on the basin of the tent. Um, and when you pack your tent, oh, oh um, do not, do not. If you value your tent, don't stuff it in. I mean. From 40 years ago, I was told you never do that with tent. You roll and fold. Um, if you're stuffing a tent into an unknown, either your backpack, um, you're gonna be driving the fabric against things in your backpack or even against the, the ties themselves, the sliders on the tent or even the zip things of the tent itself on the very fabric that's your home for the next 100 to 150 days. If you wanna do that, and that's that's up to you. I think you're insane if anyone says just stuff your tent. It's fast, it's easy. If you if you wanna do that for an $800 tent, good luck to you. I was always taught roll and fold, manufacturers say roll and fold. Um, the, uh, so I'm glad that some of the people who hike on do big videos like Homemade Wonderlust and Darwin and things like that, They've got into the. They, 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 I think one of them. I think. I, I think Dixie was sort of saying that she was stuffing the tent, and then last year she did a video saying that she, she realised this is actually better to roll and fold. You know, people knew that forty years ago, but, but obviously each generation has to go through a learning process. Um, but yeah, if anyone tells you to stuff a tent, no, you know, it's, sorry, <laughs> it's like, it's like having, having fingers go down a blackboard. But you can do what you like with your own tent. It's up to you if you want it to last. Um, right, tents in the wind, know how to pitch a tent. Some tents um, have orientations depending on how door flaps close. So specifically on the duplex and the altiplex, they have overlapping doors such that if you, uh, there are two blue tags on one side of the, of, the, of the tent and you orientate those into the wind. And what that means is if the wind's blowing this way, it just means that the door flaps naturally close over the top of the other. If, you're, if you have it around the wrong way, it actually drives them open. So um, yeah, good to know if there's any specifics about your particular tent that require you to orientate it in the wind in a certain way. Um, I uh, use trekking poles for my tent. You can buy carbon fiber poles or you can have a freestanding type tent. Um, Freestanding is great if you're car camping and you just want to move it around. You know? But when you get on trail, um, uh, do I, I've got a freestanding kit for duplex. It's great for the first week or so, and then you think, oh, it's a bit heavy. And you, you're, so, you're so now adept, maybe if you've got trekking poles that are putting up your tent, 
you, you, you can realize you don't need the, the freestanding one. You, you know, it's not like you need to get it in a really tight corner. You know, there's probably gonna be one or two occasions you might have to do that. But if you're not sufficient to, to capability to put your tent up in that, then you haven't practiced enough. You don't really need a freestanding, and they are heavy. The poles for a freestanding are notably heavy. Imagine taking those away and just using trekking poles, which you're already carrying, you've saved a huge amount of weight. And I think these are one of those learning steps that a lot of hikers go through early on. Um, uh, but this one, I'm trying to help you, you may, may not need the freestanding ones. They're just a nice convenience, but if you want the weight, that's up to you. Um, I'm just looking at the Tyvek sheet we've done, um, uh, roll and fold, we've done all tent bags, pan packing. So when you pack it away, have you noticed how most tent manufacturers provide you with a tent bag that is just irritatingly too small or so tight you have to roll it perfectly to get it in the bag? So what I do um, regularly is whenever I buy a new tent, I take one of my Dyneema storage bags, I've got loads of them, and you, you, you can go to a different store. They're all you know, one of the ones I use are slightly bigger than the ones that come with the tent. I use that as my tent bag, shove it in, roll it down. And then if I need to compress it a little bit more, I can just you know, compress it in the bag. And it just means I don't have that wrestling match every morning trying to get my tent into the original bag because it's too tight. I just get a slightly bigger bag, cinch it down and then sit on it and it just gradually compresses. Um, yes, you don't want to compress it too much because then you again, you're going to have that same problem of driving the fabric against um, you know, one of the sliders or something. Use your common sense in that regard, but don't. It's certainly better than stuffing it randomly against things. Um, yeah, I'm preaching again, sorry about that. Um, okay, I will also mention one of the most useful pieces of kit on trail is this stuff, which uh, I use religiously on all my repairs this is seam seal tape now this is the stuff that if you look inside your uh, rain jacket um, you'll see the seams and then there's this strip of tape and that's basically a seam seal this is this this tape you can um, peel off and it's very sticky but it's also very flexible it's designed originally for um, seam sealing of jackets um, and also of uh, tents um, so I use this, so I'm going to peel some of this stuff off, there you go, it's almost clear, but very sticky and tacky and it's very flexible. So I use it to repair my tents, if there's a little tear or a gash or a stress mark. I use it to repair my puffy jacket, I've, my, I've got a lot of wear around the wrists of my puffy jacket, so I've got basically got seam seal tape going around most of that. Um, I had a, you know, if you've got a tear in your quilt, it's great for that. Um, it's also good, I've also used it on a repair of my Thermarest sleeping pad where uh, I had a small puncture. I used the repair kit, which is little, little rubber beads, not uh, like, sorry, um, like glue beads that you can press into the, into the, um, into the uh, damaged area. But then I put a couple of strips of this across it to keep, give it some extra integrity. So I carry a strip of this stuff where, whenever I hike. It's uh, great for seam sealing of anything. Uh, I also loaned some long strips of this because someone was resealing, re sewing their, their failed zip and they use this to strengthen the, the, the stitching. So it has multiple uses. Um, so yeah, seam seal tape, I got this particular, it's 3M, and I got it from Z-Pax, and it's better than tenacious tape for general repairs. Um, tenacious tape is very good for if you've got a very hard wearing point. So I use tenacious tape, so I had a wearing point on, the, on my backpack, right next to my back. And tenacious tape, is, you know, if you feel it, it's much heavier material. Uh, and you can stick that on, and it's very sticky, and it, it's great for areas where there's a lots of abrasion. So uh, yeah, so that's the difference between tenacious tape and the seam seal tape. Right, sleep systems. Um, I, on the trail, tend to go for, for a quilt. Um, I've got a 10 degree down quilt. Um, I, I would all, you know, or possibly switch that out to a 20 degree bag because a bag you can cinch up and you feel, it feels slightly warmer in a bag. But yeah, so I do, on trail, I would do a 20 degree sleeping bag or a 10 degree quilt. Uh, I like the fact that you, you can open it up, especially if it's warmer, you can just have it laying on top of you. Um, I also like the fact that it um, uh, is easy to sort of move around and you can sort of move around inside it rather than be cocooned in. The downside is, is that you, you are more susceptible to draft. So if you didn't get a good seal around your sleeping pad um, with a quilt, then you are more susceptible to draft. So I actually sleep with my puffy jacket just beside me so if there's a little draft around my back I just shove the puffy into that so um, and I also uh, wear um, puffy booties uh, which 
go on my feet. So they're great for take your socks off when you go to sleep, put the puffy boots on, and they're lovely and warm. Let your feet dry out, um, uh, and they're not tightly bound in a sock as well. So I kind of like the fact that. And benefit of the booties is they keep the bottom of your quilt or sleeping bag clean for the whole hike. Um, so I uh, definitely recommend getting booties. It does sound a bit of a luxury, but they are very, very good. They have very multi multiple uses. Um, uh, make sure, uh, sorry, if, if you're feeling cold, you, if a 10 degree is not enough, you could go low or you could think about layering with a liner. Um, I, uh, uh, I've seen people using liners, certainly through the Sierra, because that added, added extra capability. Um, now, if it gets really, really cold, um, what I've got is I've got a 10 degree quilt and I've got a 40 degree quilt, which is super lightweight, which I might send to my to the Sierra this year, which uh, so I use the third, a 10 degree all the way up the trail. But if it get, if I start really suffering from the cold, then I'll just send the 40 degree and I'll have that over the top of my 10 degree, which is really a good combination, nice layering system. And the other benefit of that, and, and again, I'm not saying it's the general usage, is having a second layer, whether it's a liner or a sleeping bag or another quilt, whatever you do, multi layers is good because then you can build them up. And the other thing is if the top layer, if there is any condensation, then the top layer gets all the condensation dropping down rather than your main you know, close to you quilt uh, so bear that in mind i did read somewhere that someone actually also had a tyvek sheet inside their tent over the top of themselves just as um i thought that was an interesting um you know if it's really cold and there's lots of content that's an interesting idea as well maybe do that but again it's just giving you that layering capability um uh my sleeping pad i had um an r rating of 3.2 so that's a mid-range you can go up to off fives and sixes it was really cold um don't underestimate the need for a sleeping pad of some kind certainly in the cold weather you do lose a lot of heat to the ground uh so that's why i use comp a quilt in combination with a thermo um, sleeping pad I also use one of those thin granite gear, one eighth of an inch thin pads, which most people think, oh, what's a pathetic, what do you use that for? Really surprisingly useful piece of kit. I use it as a sit pad, but I also use it as sort of storage in, inside my tent if I'm packing something like in, inside that I want to protect. But the most useful thing is that when you put it in, you go camping in your tent, you put it on the base underneath your sleeping pad. And what it does is it stops your sliding, your sleeping pad from sliding around during the night. So, um, and it gives you another extra insulation for cold weather and it weighs next to nothing. So that's another random sort of unexpected piece of kit that um, I think is very, very useful to have. So uh, um, pillows, you might think, do I really need a pillow? Right, for the first 30 years of camping, I, I never used a pillow. I always used my backpack, uh, just you know, stuffed up. Um, I had trouble sleeping on my first through hike. I couldn't never nail what it was. Um, on a hiker box, I picked out a pillow, someone had dropped it, tried it, changed everything. And I, I can still, can't, to this day, cannot explain why. Um, don't be surprised if, you, if you're having trouble sleeping, try a few things, um, mix it up a bit. I actually had to go through a couple of iterations of my sleeping pad to get work out what one worked for me. Um, same with pillow, you, you know, may laughingly say, hey, that is a pillow. Um, what you find is, is that when you're 18 to 20 or 30, is your tolerances to comfort is, you know, fairly low, limited. Once you get older, and you're, you're like me, I'm 55, 56, um, uh, yeah, I find that the, the weirdest things throw me off. And if I can't get sleep, good night's sleep, then my whole day's ruined. So yeah, don't don't underestimate the importance of being, making sure you get a good night's sleep. Right, I'll stop there and move on to the next one.